example, I'm still I'm still showing my screen right now, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Absolutely. yeah. I'm gonna just uh, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take off this audio and then. Okay. Just do this. The recording has started. Welcome everybody to our uh, second uh, talk of this uh, webinar series on uh, music embodiment and neuroscience. We are particularly happy today to welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Zachary Wallmarker from the University of Oregon. And with no much further ado, I leave it to Anna Kolesnikov, who organized this uh, series to introduce him to, to all of us. And I'm looking forward the, to the talk, which really deals uh, um, on, uh, uh, we'll speak about uh, um, a very fascinating topic, the human voice. Please, Anna. Uh, thank you, Vittorio. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, Zach. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us um, for the 2023 spring edition of the Neuroscience Webinar Talk, uh, Neuro Neuroscience and Hum Humanities uh, webinar series, um, Embodied Music Reception, uh, a Biocultural Approach. And um, so, as Victoria said, um, this session was also uh, actually co-organized by Joshua Bamford, who will be joining us in a bit. Um, I'm very pleased to present our second speaker, Professor Zachary uh, Walmark. Um, Zachary Walmark is a musicologist with an interest in popular music, timbre, and music cognition. He is Associate Professor of Musicology at the Department of Academic Music affiliated faculty member at the Center for Translational Neuroscience and director of the MuSci Lab at the University of Oregon. He holds a PhD in musicology from the University of California, a master in musicology and ethnomusicology at the University of Oregon, and a bachelor of music in music performance, the double bass at New York University. Working at the intersection of the cognitive sciences and musicology, Zach's research seeks to account for the role of musical timbre and emotional response, aesthetic judgment, and music sociology, particularly in the context of post-1945 American popular music. In his book, Nothing But Noise, Timbre and Musical Meeting at the Edge, uh, which is a fascinating book, he explores the slippery psychoacoustic and social fault lines separating perceptions of musical timbre from noise. He's also co-editor of the award-winning volume, The Relentless Pursuit of Tone, Timbre and Popular Music. In addition to his academic achievements, uh, Zachary Walmark is a published composer, commercial musician, jazz bassist, and performer of the Japanese shakuhaki flute. I hope I pronounced yeah. that kind of Very correctly. Close. <laughs> and so with no further ado, um, Professor Walmark, um, please, we're very excited for your talk. Thank you very much for inviting me. And it's just such a delight and an honor to be joining uh, your group today. Um, I especially, of course, want to thank uh, you, Anna, and uh, Vittorio, uh, Joshua, who is going to be joining us shortly, uh, for thinking to invite me to share some of this work. Um, I guess I'll just I'll just dive right in. I, I should mention beforehand that I uh, would not be offended at all if you wanted to jump in with any questions, comments, corrections. Um, I believe you might be muted, but there's probably a way to indicate a hand or something like this in Teams. I'm not super familiar with Teams, but um, if oh, yes. we could have this be a conversation, um, if if there's anything you want, a point you wanted to make in in the middle of this. Yes, sorry uh, if I can just intervene. Mm -hmm. please, oh, please raise your hands um, um, if you have a, a a quick question during the talk. Otherwise, please save it for the very end or for the discussion. Sorry, sorry about that. Thank you, Zach. Not at all. And um, just so everybody knows, too, I can't see anybody um, as I'm presenting now, so I, I won't be able I won't be able to be responsive to your needs. And I apologize for that in advance. So I, I thought I'd set the stage for this talk um, with a little bit of footage from the early days of our most recent pandemic um, right in the backyard here of our lecture series hosts. Um, of course, in response to the social distancing measures, uh, people in Italian cities took to their balconies to connect to each other through song, and this was all over the global news media.
Erre rendet a fátyú visén. E allora sì, abbraccio mocchio fuori. So this was really the first major global music related story to emerge during the pandemic. And of course, it pertains to music's connection to our social world and specifically here to the human voice. Um, in this talk today, I'd like to explore some recent research uh, showing how music relates to social cognition, empathy and ethics. Uh, and specifically, I'm going to be uh, focusing today on just one aspect of musical sound, one that um, is of particular interest to me, and that is, of course, timbre, um, a factor of musical sound that often has evaded scholarly attention. Uh, I'm going to be arguing that sound timbre, uh, both of individual voices, um, but also of instruments, carries a unique kind of ethical claim in music-mediated social cognition. Uh, to make this argument, I'm going to try to weave together two halves of, of our host lab's name, the, uh, the, the neuroscientific and the humanistic, um, integrating these two discourses on the contribution of timbre to musical engagement and social response. Uh, just to give you a brief overview of the talk, and this is going to really uh, occur in, in two very different sections with a, a different kind of presentational voice and um, different, of course, modes of evidence and argumentation. Part one, uh, we'll examine how timbre relates to social cognition and empathy through two basic paradigms of research that um, I've used in my, in my lab over the last number of years. Uh, first of all, uh, some neuroimaging evidence of the association of traits and empathic, um, empathic concern, emp empathic fantasy taking, um, some other aspects of, of individual differences in empathy and tamper processing. Um, and second, the paradigm of rapid music cognition. Uh, taken together, I hope these two orientations will establish an empirical scientific grounding for part two of this talk, um, in which I'm going to try to theorize and speculate a little bit um, on the broader implications of these empirical result results for an ethics of music. Uh, I will present a few brief historical case studies here and engage with the philosophical ethics of Emmanuel Levinas, whose metaphor, an idea of the face, um, I believe carries some really rich potential in explaining and explicating Tambor's role in musical affect and empathy. Um, so let me just jump right into part one. Uh, I'd like to start with some, some fundamentals. Why do we make music and uh, what's its purpose? These might seem like some fairly uh, facetious questions, but it's actually quite far from clear. And uh, some of the greatest minds have been struggling with these questions for a long time. Darwin, for instance, weighed in on the evolutionary mystery of music about 150 years ago. Of course, he, he has this to say, as neither the enjoyment nor the capacity of producing musical notes are faculties of the least use to man, to humankind, they must be ranked amongst the most mysterious with which they are endowed. Okay, so what do we actually know about this human obsession with music? We're going to start really broad, we're going to start really ancient, and very quickly funnel our attention to this topic of timbre. Um, first of all, uh, a few facts about sort of what we understand about music now. Uh, the first uh, relevant uh, point to make, I believe, is that music is quite, quite old. We have archaeological evidence from 40, 50,000 years before the common era of music making practices. This is an instance here of a, of a woolly mammoth ivory flute. Um, there are artifacts um, made from extinct cave bear, from vulture bone, dating from this period and even predating this. So we know humans have been doing this for an extremely long time. Um, we also know that music is more or less a human universal. Um, defining universal as, of course, something that, that we see across across the globe in, in every known extant culture across time. Human beings engage in musical activities, period. It almost seems to be essential to, to what we are as a species. 
We also know that musical behaviors are very early to develop uh, within a human life lifespan. So already uh, at just a couple of weeks of age, infants are able to perform vocal mimetic um, gesturings and back and forth with a caregiver, okay? Imitating vocal expression, imitating different qualities, affective qualities of the voice. So why is this? Why is it ancient? Why is it so universal? Uh, and why is this feature so quick to develop? And oftentimes some of the earliest behaviors to develop um, in human development also oftentimes of course represents something that is very important uh, going going forward. So there have been a number of theories that have been posited over the years. And I think just in the last couple, two years or so, um, this, this conversation has really, I think, reached uh, a, a, a kind of an inflection point with two articles in Brain and Behavioral Sciences last year by Patrick Savage and group and Psyche Louie, who presented in this lecture series a couple weeks ago, was one of the co-authors of that paper, arguing for a social bonding theory of music. Uh, Sam Mayer at Harvard um, and his colleagues published um, another article uh, with a competing hypothesis about credible signaling. But um, whether we follow Savage's approach or Mayer's, David Huron has been speculating on these points for the last 20 years as well. Um, most theories are revolving more and more around some kind of social account for music. Um, whether it be social bonding and cohesion, mate selection, this was Darwin's theory of, of music, by the way, uh, coordinated group activities, intergenerational cultural transmission, credible signaling. These are all social cognitive uh, activities, we might say, or these are all, of course, related or relevant to how we interact as, as a group. Um, so we, we might even say that music cognition could be considered as a kind of specialized subtype of social cognition. That when we're listening to music, uh, we oftentimes engage the same kinds of social cognitive processes um, as we might if we're engaging just with, with other people directly. Um, and of course, this is not just a feature of musical communication, but in many, in many extents of the arts more generally, particularly the performance arts. Um, music theorists have uh, really been keen to sort of explore this relationship more and more in the last 20 years or so. Uh, the systematic musicologist, the Belgian systematic musicologist, Marc Lehmann, uh, writes that music can be conceived, I love this quote, as a virtual social agent. Listening to music can be, can be seen uh, as a socializing activity in the sense that it may train the listener's self in social attuning and empathic relationships. Um, our friend, of course, the, the late Oliver Sacks uh, has this to say, and music is, has, a has, a, has a bonding power. It's primal social cement. So this idea of empathic relationships, um, this notion that music uh, is a, a subtype of social cognition, of course, brings us into this broader question of empathy. Um, Eisenberger and colleagues, this is just one definition of this, of course, very, very complex and rich phenomenon. Um, Eisenberger in 91 des described this as an emotional response that stems from another's emotional state or condition is incongruent with the other's emotional state or condition. We might expand this definition a bit uh, to also encompass, of course, cognitive processes uh, beyond just emotional responses. But this idea of kind of matching, right, of being able to pick up on somebody else's state and experience something uh, roughly congruent with that. Um, of course, uh, neuroscientists over the last number of years have uh, dug quite deep into what might be responsible for empathic connection with others. Um, this paper, for instance, this is a review paper, uh, now relatively old, uh, but at this point, this this paper was kind of com was was uh, pulling together um, the state of the art. Uh, findings on this core empathy network, what areas of the brain seem to be most active um, in various empathy relevant tasks. And uh, Fan and colleagues found that uh, cognitive empathy, that is the, the tendency to, you know, the ability to sort of think and uh, imagine what another's, think, uh, another's uh, thinking, um, and affective empathy, which is uh, the congruency with somebody else's emotional state. Um, seem to overlap in these areas across a number of studies. 
Uh, Insula has been implicated uh, as part of the core empathy network, uh, parts of the cingulates, paracingulates, uh, and then some um, premotor areas like the supplementary motor area. So when we look at individual differences in, in empathy, in trait empathy or, dis, or dispositional empathy, um, there have been a number of studies over the years that have, have really tracked and looked closely at this question of, of uh, whether there are individual differences as a function of differences in trait uh, that uh, have neurophysiological consequences in core empathy areas uh, to how they respond to others. For instance, pain, Avenanti was looking at uh, images, videos um, of, of people receiving an injection. Okay, to show that folks who are who had higher trait empathy exhibited greater activation in some of these areas of the core empathy network. Um, emotional facial expressions. Um, one of my colleagues here at the University of Oregon, for instance, uh, used these images of faces um, and looked at differences in trait empathy and how people perceive faces. And also, of course, sounds. Okay, so differences as a function of trait empathy to how we process. Uh, auditory stimuli. I want to just just take a few seconds here, and I know this this is uh, this is a very basic review for probably most people in this room right now. But I, I do feel it's important to just to, to to briefly give a little bit more background on this before we then transition definitively into the realm of music and timbre. Um, but one of the subtypes of music um, uh, researchers have have often subdivided empathy into into two. Uh, related but not necessarily uh, completely, of course, overlapping constructs, one emotional or aff affective empathy and the other cognitive empathy. Uh, emotional empathy uh, has been defined uh, by some as feeling with somebody else, okay, this idea of congruence in emotional state, which has oftentimes been theorized and shown to be more a bit more of a bottom-up process, not as subject to executive control, okay, uh, compared to cognitive empathy. Uh, a number of researchers, uh, of course, uh, researchers uh, in, in this, this digital space right now um, have uh, demonstrated uh, with some very influential work over the last number of decades, um, a motor response or a kind of mirror uh, uh, motor resonance uh, components oftentimes to effective empathic responses uh, that seems to share some kind of a link to overt imitation. This overt imitation uh, of course, can be modulated by a number of social and contextual factors. Um, we have some pretty decent evidence, for instance, that interpersonal rapport, you know, how much you like another person uh, can influence the degree to which you uh, non-consciously imitate their behavior overtly. Um, these processes can be fairly automatic. Uh, they can, again, evade conscious, uh, conscious sort of consideration. Uh, and they appear to be rather phylogenetically ancient. Um, this is what's driven, dr uh, drawn some researchers to connect notions of emotional or affective empathy to emotional contagion networks. Okay, sort of catching or picking up on the emotional state of another person um, and uh, mirroring or mimicking uh, some degree of that expression. Let's move into music at this point. Now that we've established something of foundation uh, more generally on some of the social cognitive uh, anchors that are going to help orient us uh, in the rest of this talk. Music um, has been integrated into discussions of empathy for quite some time. Um, the philosopher Theodore Lips at the beginning of the 20th century uh, really liked to look very closely at aesthetic experience at um, performance, human performance. So he, for instance, he, he writes uh, a bit about watching uh, tightrope walkers at a circus, things like this. So watching other people in context of, in performative context was an important part of this nascent development of his notion of empathy, which he defines the Einfühlung as feeling into the other. Um, of course, this already suggests a kind of self other exchange here. And aesthetic experience for lips is a kind of vicarious experience of another of another human being. Um, when we're talking about music, it might be it might be somewhat, I think, 
uh, intuitive to understand how you might experience another human if you're watching a tightrope walker. But when we're talking about musical sound, particularly musical sound divorced from visual context, uh, say like all the recordings we listen to now, when you don't have the performer live in front of you. Um, this raises a really interesting question. This question of who, who or what are we actually empathizing with when we're engaging with music? Um, and folks have posited different answers to this over the years. The philosopher Gerald Levinson uh, suggested that music materializes a kind of virtual, he calls it a persona, that um, when we're listening to a piece of music, that, that, that piece of music itself kind of creates this virtual presence, and we empathize with that, that presence created by the music. Um, others have suggested that uh, the empathic connection with music can be to what we imagine to be the lived experience of who created the music. Okay, so if we know that a composer was going through a particular uh, kind of personal trauma, for instance, when writing a piece of music and channeling that trauma, um, we might empathize with that experience. Uh, Lawrence has talked about this idea, kind of this abstract message of the music. We might resonate with the spiritual or political or social message. Um, maybe we even resonate with our own affective motor agency. So music is affecting us in some way when we listen to it. Um, and uh, we attribute those emotions to the music when in fact, uh, really this is a sort of auto-generated and we're responding to our own feelings to the music. We're misattributing the feelings to the music when in fact, it's our own affective and motor agency as embodied listeners that are driving these reactions. Um, of course, these are all, uh, these are not mutually exclusive theories, uh, but authors have really engaged in depth with this question. Um, when we're talking about empathy, uh, therefore we are implicitly entering into the territory of ethics. How do we treat others with care? How do we live justly and morally? And, and these questions might seem rather far removed from music, but if music is fundamental to the human social fabric, then we must take seriously the role it is capable of playing in human interactions. Uh, as the musicologist Simon Frith has observed, quote, aesthetic judgments are tangled up with ethical judgments, unquote. So where is the ethical claim of music? This, of course, is an extremely complex, but I think crucial question. Researchers have examined a number of musical features in an effort to track precisely what it is about musical sound that seems to sonify the presence of other human agents. And these are just a few recent, really excellent, um, somewhat recent studies looking at differences in trait empathy in music. Um, some of these studies have looked at, for instance, rhythmic patterning, the potential for entrainment that comes about through rhythm. Um, others have focused on global affective features of music, such as qualities of sadness or perceived joy or anger in music and many, many other variables. Today, however, I'm going to focus on just this one component of sound that has long been overlooked in these types of conversations, and that is timbre. So what is timbre exactly? Um, timbre, again, like some like a construct such as empathy has ha received many definitions over the years, some competing, um, many of them uh, mutually reinforcing. Uh, one sort of more or less standard definition uh, could be that, that timbre is that attribute of auditory sensation whereby a listener can judge that two sounds are dissimilar using any criteria other than pitch, loudness, or dur duration. In other words, this has oftentimes been defined something in the negative. When we cancel out pitch, when we cancel out loudness, when we cancel out temporal dimensions of musical sound, we're left with this thing called timbre. This is what differentiates my voice from uh, Vittorio's voice, from Anna's voice, when matched for pitch and loudness and duration. Okay, This is also what, of course, distinguishes instruments from one from another. Um, Stephen Handel, the psychologist, uh, has a has a, a simpler and more pragmatic definition. He just says this is what an acoustic event sounds like. OK, um, this is uh, sort of not dealing with uh, its interrelations um, and covariance with notions like with pitch and loudness and things like this. Uh, timbre is famously multidimensional. It has been much more difficult and uh, squirrely to uh, pull together and to truly understand compared to many other aspects of music. This is part of the reason why musicologists and music theorists have tended to neglect timbre uh, for so long. 
uh, unlike something uh, like pitch, which goes up and down, right? You have sort of a monotonic continuum or loudness, which goes from soft to loud. Uh, timbre is multidimensional. It has a couple different interacting uh, variables to consider. First of all, the, the, idea, the spectrum, the power spectrum. We can think of this, uh, if we're looking at this, this, this visualization here, which is called the spectrogram, as the vertical dimension of sound. Okay, uh, where, uh, where energy lives in a sound, from high frequencies to low frequencies. We can think about timbre in terms of its temporal or horizontal dimension, how it changes or unfolds over time. Uh, there's also a bunch of crucial elements in timbre perception dealing with the beginnings and the, the ends of sounds, peculiarities to different instrument types. Uh, for instance, a violin uh, will always begin uh, a note with a, a, a very brief, noisy um, attack as that string begins to excite or as the bow begins to excite the string. If you remove that initial 20, 30 milliseconds, sometimes it can be difficult to tell what instrument you're listening to. Um, so this is just a, a very, very brief overview of, of timbre as, a, as, a, as an attribute of sound. Um, but I, I, what I'm most concerned with in this talk and what I really want to focus the rest of our energies on is looking at how uh, timbre has some kind of a semiotic uh, claim. And um, I think the first point to mention here uh, that's going to be really relevant for us moving on is this, this notion that timbre is most often in human life an indexical uh, sign. Um, again, this differentiates uh, timbre from, from some of the other elements of musical sound. It indexes things in the world. Okay? And in Piercy and Semiotics, the idea of the index is a sign that points to its object by way of co-occurrence. So a classic example here might be something like uh, fire and smoke. Okay, Smoke is indexical of the fire. They co-occur. Um, and timbre oftentimes does this, and it's doing this right now, right? Uh, when your mother calls you on the telephone, you, you don't have to ask who this is. You know immediately who it is because the quality of that voice is disclosing the identity of the person. Timbre, um, again, in most situations of naturalistic listening, is equated immediately and unproblematically with source identity. Source identity can be defined quite broadly. It might just be an instrument you're identifying or a particular person, a group of people, um, somebody with an accent. Okay, this might mark that person as being as belonging to a particular kind of background. Uh, a musical genre works this way. Social stereotypes about that genre work this way. Uh, so timbre is indexing its sources in different ways and it's doing so very, very quickly. Um, this is a relevant fact here that we're going to be returning to that uh, timbre already within 100 to 200 milliseconds, this is a somewhat pre-attentive range as shown with studies using mismatch negativity and a, a number of other modalities, we're able to pre-attentively categorize the affective valence of timbre um, very, very quickly, uh, well before we're able to uh, really process and understand pitch content, for instance, let alone lyrics or something like this in music. We've already uh, sorted uh, the music according to its timbral identity by way of these indexical relationships. Um, another uh, point of relevance to developing a semiotics of timbre is the fact that uh, timbre is oftentimes very effectively or emotionally potent. Uh, Pierre Boulez, for instance, talked about timbre as being the signpost for the emotions. Um, and even going back to, you know, to the early 20th century, Arnold Schoenberg in Harmonia Lyra talks about how timbre uh, really can only be ever understood with the heart, with the emotions. Uh, that seems to have this kind of direct, unmediated uh, access point for our effective processing. Um, it's also, uh, as some have noted, have noted uh, quite difficult to rationalize. Uh, oftentimes non-conscious, oftentimes we're having a rich, deep experience with music. Timbre might be a very important factor driving this reaction, um, but we're, we might be inclined to misattribute our reactions uh, and maybe uh, attribute them to the harmonic vocabulary of the music or to the lyrics when in fact timbre is playing a really important role as well. Uh, 
but timbre oftentimes operates non-consciously. Uh, Cornelia Fales calls this the subterranean impact of timbre. We don't know what it's doing to us oftentimes. Okay, we're unaware of it. And that, that lack of awareness, I think, is a crucial part of this ethical story we're going to be telling as we move into this talk. So let me just illustrate this really, really briefly. I'm, I'm going to play a super brief sound. Listen up, because this is, this is very short. Um, but I think what I want to try to do right now is, as you hear this sound, this brief sound, try to place this sound. How would you categorize this sound? What would you say about it? What sort of social world does it connote? Here's the sound. That's it. Okay, that's that's 400 milliseconds right there. That's if less than half a second. Um, I hope everybody was able to hear that just fine. <laughs> um, but if we start to think about sort of the indexicality of that extremely brief, brief blip of sound I just played, we might start with the level, say, of an instrument, okay? A pedal steel or a steel guitar. Um, at least for me, that really rings out. You also heard a voice in there. There's some other stuff happening in this really short blip. But for me, it's the steel guitar that really uh, comes to, to most perceptual salience when I listen to that. Um, but this might signify other things as well than just the instrument itself. This might signal a particular kind of orientation within American popular music, specifically 1950s, country western, honky-tonk music. Uh, this, in fact, comes from a song by Hank Williams, uh, the great country singer from the early, late 40s and early 1950s. Okay, so maybe it's indexing him. Maybe it's indexing early country. Maybe it's indexing what I imagine fans of country music in the United States or globally to be like, okay? Maybe this is actually moving beyond the instrument, moving beyond the artist and signaling a broader kind of social category to me, uh, which of course is going to be uh, extremely variable and subjectively determined by the listener. We might also think more generally about what this community might represent or how this, what this might stereotype or point to. Okay, this is all to say, and of course we can keep going, that a brief, brief sound like this uh, can activate a rich, complex network of associations and meaning. Okay, this is indexically a, a very rich sign in pointing to different kinds of uh, co-occurring factors. Okay, of course, there's also a whole symbolic um, dimension of this i'm not even going to go into it right now um but uh just i think to suffice it to say uh timbre is able to carry all this information uh and again this is you were having this reaction without any recourse to pitch relationships to melodic contour to harmonic orientation to song form or any of the syntactical features of music this is coming from just that one sound um, so at this point, I, I want to share a little bit um, from some studies that my, that my lab has has overtaken, has undertaken over the last number of years, uh, going into some of these questions in a bit more depth using um, imaging tools, using some behavioral paradigms, particularly uh, paradigms of rapid music perception, which uh, I believe can shed some interesting light on on timbre. So let me start, I guess, with um, a paper from a few years ago. This is 2018 um, with Troy Debliak, um, who's at, at the University of Leuven, and Marco Iacoboni at uh, University of California, Los Angeles. Um, th this paper, we're looking at neurophysiological uh, differences um, or effects of trade empathy in music listening. And there's a few different experiments uh, in this, this study, but I, I just want to focus on, on our first experiment uh, today. Uh, in this first experiment, what we were looking for here were the neural correlates of trait empathy in perception of just these isolated sounds. Um, the question driving our research was whether individual differences in empathy modulate how we process timbre. Um, again, isolated from other musical variables. So these are just these are our short sounds. Uh, this was a small study. Uh, the other experiments here were had a, a bit of a larger end. So this was a, a small passive listening task. Uh, in the scanner, um, in which participants uh, heard some very short instrument vo voice and voice tones, um, played in a, a couple different versions, a version that's more or less regular, like a saxophone just playing a normal note, um, versus a saxophone growling out that same note, or a voice singing with a nice pure oh sound, and then kind of doing some gnarly 
gravelly. Oh, but the same. That was a terrible impression of it. I apologize. But uh, the same note, the same match for duration, match for loudness, just uh, different uh, features of timbre, different spectral disposition. Uh, we then had folks use the interpersonal reactivity index, which is a very commonly used um, measure of trait empathy um, or empathy as a function of individual um, individual differences as this behavioral regressor in the model. And uh, we went into this experiment with a particular hypothesis here. We hypothesized that higher empathy people, in other words, folks who on the subscales of the IRI that we were that we were interested in, um, uh, you know, who scored a little bit higher on on this scale compared to others, would exhibit greater activation in some of these empathics or social cognitively relevant areas uh, when listening to isolated timbres. And specifically here, we're interested in these noisy versions. Okay, uh, not just timbre processing, but the processing of sounds with these noisy components uh, compared to lower empathy folks. And I want to just share a couple results um, from from this study. When we compare the task that is just listening to timbres versus um, versus baseline, uh, baseline being uh, nothing at all, um, but include um, as a regressor in this model uh, this IRI information. In other words, differences in this is trait. This is perspective taking. Is the PT? That's the blue stuff. Uh, fantasy scale is the green, and then the the red on the uh, the right of your screen is going to be empathic concern. So this is folks who have uh, you know who score higher on these scales just simply listening to timbre, um, listening to these isolated tones versus not listening. Um, and you can see a, you know, a few areas that seem to be preferentially engaged by folks who tended to uh, take others' perspectives more frequently. This is some some supplementary motor area. Um, singulate areas um, in fantasy scale. Th this was a very clear supplementary motor area signature, also SMA with empathic concern, um, as well as some anterior insula. Uh, when we look a little bit more granularly at this difference between normal and noisy sounds, uh, there were also a few uh, a few differences uh, that seemed to resonate. Um, in interesting ways, we thought, uh, with some of the, the, the literature on social cognition, um, when folks who, who scored very high in the fantasy scale, uh, for instance, were listening to the normal versions of these various instrumental and vocal sound producers compared to the noisy sound producers, uh, we saw a preferential engagement, for instance, in areas like the temporal parietal junction, um, which is... Uh, one of the major areas that have been implicated in studies of mentalizing and theory of mind. Um, also, uh, frontal gyrus areas, uh, uh, anterior insula, uh, this is consistent with the, the core empathy network that we, we saw earlier. Um, when we flip this polarity or this relationship, this contrast, and look at um, when we compare noisy uh, greater than normal versions of these sound producers, um, particularly, I, I think that the real story here uh, is the empathic concern that folks who tend to sympathize more with others in distress heard these qualities of noisy timbre, oftentimes involving a kind of or signaling, betokening, indexing a kind of, in the voice at least, a kind of distress. Or in certain instruments, uh, if we think about instruments as somehow mimetic of the voice, uh, something like distorted electric guitar or a growled saxophone um, resemble in many ways um, a growling uh, voice um, and those folks showed uh, a higher degree of, of signal in uh, supplementary motor area uh, compared to, to to folks who had who, who had lower empathic concern so together this this suggested to us and again this is a this is a small study and, and we really need to follow up um, using some different paradigms on the implications of this study uh, but this suggests that, that empathic listeners were a bit more likely to catch the motor mimetic implications of noisy tones, such as a growled voice, growled saxophone. A traits level tendency to feel concern um, for others translates into heightened motor empathy for timbre, particularly these noisier varieties. Uh, 
I want to transition now and, and look at some results from rac rapid cognition studies. And, and first of all, regarding the rapidity of effective responses to timbre, we have to ask ourselves whether such an unnatural thing as these tiny short blips of music are even a reliable naturalistic indication of music preference at all. OK, we heard this Hank Williams. Does that actually say anything at all about how we would perceive country music more generally or that song that artists more generally or was it did, was it is it too impoverished in information to say much um to ask this question um a few colleagues and i uh wanted to explore this question of whether snap judgments about music are consistent with more deliberative appraisals so when we have more of the perceptual picture to do this, we use this rapid preference evaluation task. Basically, folks were asked, how much do you like this music on a scale? Uh, they heard 50 different music clips in a few different condi conditions. These uh, music clips were partitioned according to this model you know, into different kind of genre or uh, stylistic implications. And they listened to three clips of this, three durations of the same clips of music. So listen to 150 short clips. Um, some in a 400 millisecond condition, a one millisecond condition, or one second condition, a four second condition. Uh, four seconds of music listening gives you a lot of information. Okay, this is a decently reliable proxy for you to be able to identify genre, decade of recording, these kinds of things. So this is this is kind of what these sound like. So those are the 400 milliseconds. Um, and we use a, a, a fairly large online sample for this study. Uh, so again, we're comparing how people respond uh, to the same clips of music across different time scales. And when you compare, for instance, uh, the preference at four seconds, what what people say, how much people say they like all these all these clips, uh, compared to their preference at four hundred milliseconds, there's a really clear linear relationship between the two. And this is across these different styles of music um, re related to Renfro's um, model of, uh, of musical style categorizations. Um, in linear regression models, in fact, we found that almost 60% of the variance in the ratings of the long excerpts could be explained by the ratings of the short excerpts. Now, what exactly does this mean? Uh, if this additional musical context of the long version does, does not significantly budge the needle of appraisal, it stands to reason that judgments of music were significantly formed in this first 400 milliseconds, this first instant. That is less than half a second is enough time for people to form a really quick and dirty opinion of music. And having access to more of the perceptual picture largely replicates the original snap judgment. This dictated pretty much entirely, largely by timbre. Okay, I wanna just go a bit more into this paradigm. Um, with a, a look at genre identification um, and how that might be able to then predict social identification. Uh, so in this particular study, I, I asked this question. It was the question was whether identifying with brief clips of music, these are again 400 milliseconds, relates to a feeling of identification with the people that you imagine to be associated with that music, fans of that music. OK, uh, so people perform these two ratings tasks independently, both uh, listening to short clips and uh, responding to a scale of the degree to which they feel that they identify strongly with that with that type of music or with with that music and then how much they identify with the social with the fans the people who they imagine like that type of music um, again a bunch of really short musical clips and different types of popular music genres um, and when we sort of this is just a basic correlations table, but I think it makes the point um, in a really elegant way. These correlations between musical identification and social identification based upon 400 millisecond clips and um, comparing results between these two conditions, the social identification and musical identification. It's really clear that people's appraisals of timbral snapshots are roughly synonymous with their social evaluations. OK, all these bolded uh, significant correlations, people who identify with country clips tend to also identify with the people who they associate with country music, for instance. Um, this is probably quite unsurprising. Liking these brief excerpts corresponds with a feeling of belonging to their associated community. Suggestively, however, musical and social empathy appear to be largely exclusionary 
Participants identified with people who like the music they themselves like, as expressed in these statistically significant correlations between the two, but not with the people who don't, uh, expressed by all these, these, uh, these correlations here that are not statistically significant. When we consider that a split second is enough time to trigger this kind of musical and social sorting, it's clear that differences in timbre can be perceptually equivalent or isomorphic to social difference. And at this point, I want to just take a, just a pause for a moment here before moving into part two to summarize what we've established. Uh, what does this tell us about an ethics of timbre? And the next part of the talk is going to explore this question. Okay, just to summarize, timbre rapidly indexes people, things in the world, genres, social categories, a number of other factors. Um, and empathy in the social realm is associated with neurophysiological differences in timbre processing. Um, so I'd like to shift tone a little bit at this point. Um, and Anna, I hope I'm okay for time. Um, is that is? Yes. I, I'm okay for time. Oh, fantastic. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, please, please cut me off um, if 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 I'm getting to the end um, of what is reasonable to expect. Um, yeah. No worries. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've seen so far. In this, uh, I hope that I sort of thickened and established um, some evidence for how qualities of timbre, uh, particularly qualities of timbre perceived to be noisy or unpleasant, can activate or shut down empathic responding insofar as they index specific people or groups of people or stereotypes. Because all timbres are materially determined, uh, voices and instruments have timbres that are specific to them alone. With the possible exception, of course, of electronically generated sound, that is, timbre is immutably bound to the human body and uh, to our interaction. Zach, yep. sorry, we just, um, there's a bit of interference with your microphone. That's all. So we oh. just, mm -hmm. but and now, mm -hmm. is it, are you hearing things okay now? Yeah, there was just probably maybe some movement. Now it's good. Yeah, just so oh, you I'm know. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. I, Thanks. I appreciate you stopping me. Thanks. Um, so, uh, timbre is very closely related to embodiment, and um, unlike musical parameters such as pitch, for instance, timbre is multidimensional and uh, profoundly variable according to different circumstances of sound production. It reflects the presence of others by sonically manifesting their physical particularity. That's the reason why my voice sounds different from somebody else's. Uh, Nina Eidsheim calls this fundamental uh, dynamic of timbre, the acousmatic question posed by timbre. And that question is, who is this? This is the indexical claim of timbre, right? Like a fingerprint or an accent, this makes timbre a potent marker of individual and collective identity. Our perceptual systems evolved, in fact, to connect sounds with things and people in an indexical way as quickly and transparently as possible. And timbre does heavy lifting to enable the seamless equation of sound and source, though always, even if seemingly innate and natural within a, a specific symbolically mediated context. Uh, perceiving sound objects, um, notes the psychologist Stephen Handel, is much like perceiving faces. And there's something quite literal here about the relationship between vocal timbre, for instance, and somebody's face. So if timbre is a kind of aural face, how do we interpret situations where musical empathy is irrevocably thrown into question on, on the battlefield of timbral appraisal? The, the anthropologist David Howes explains, quote, within each sensory field, sensations deemed relatively unpleasant or dangerous will be linked to unpleasant, dangerous social groups, unquote. In certain conditions, negative timbre appraisals uh, like the contextual reading of a certain bad sound as noise, uh, are not merely a matter of personal distaste, but of social ordering. Acoustic qualities that register as noise can quickly shift from a purely auditory kind of perception to judgments about the individuals or the kinds of people who produce such disagreeable sound, just as bodies are gendered, raced, classed, and many other things besides. They are timbered. And Negative appraisals often serve as a referendum on a person's or a group's character, worth, sophistication, morality, civility, virtue, and intelligence, among many other qualities. A breakdown of empathy towards another's aural face can also be an ethical failure towards the people whose bodies stand behind it. 
a failure to deem meaningful the timbre of the other. History is replete with all kinds of examples of, of such ethical failures, and I document this in my book. I'm not going to go into it now. Uh, but for our purposes today, I'd, I'd like to briefly flesh out a bit how timbre might function as an ethical claim. The animating concepts of the previous empirical work I've reviewed, uh, as well as these reflections, resonate really uncannily with the influential work of French-Lithuanian philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, who, who first coined the metaphor of the face in his work on ethics. I'd like to survey briefly how Levinas's ideas might productively inform our understanding of how timbre relates to empathy and ethics. Put very briefly right now, this is a complex theory, I'm going to try to put narrow it into one paragraph. Uh, Levinas argues that the self can only be constituted in direct relationship with what he calls the absolutely other, the incomprehensible difference between you and me, between other people. I can only know myself because I'm capable first of responding to you. Crucially then to Levinas, the other must remain radically separate, aloof and inassimilable. Rather than reconciling the binarism of the self-other distinction, Levinas seeks to maintain an unbridgeable distance between the two, an asymmetrical relationship that prevents knowledge of and reciprocity, reciprocity with the other. The self in Levinasian ethics is thus burdened with the weight of profound ethical responsibility. Encountering the face of the other, he argues, one is confronted with the demand of another fundamentally different human presence. And this moment of naked receptivity orders and ordains one to respond, to recognize the shared, though wholly different humanity of another person and act in ways that are consonant with their inviolable uniqueness and autonomy as subjects. This act of altruistic encounter, he terms the face to face. But the face, we need to be totally clear at this point, is only a metaphor for the, dis the difference of the other, a difference that is consummated revealingly not in sight, not in looking at somebody else's face, but through sound, which is responding to another's speech. He writes uh, that the face is present in its refusal to be In this sense, it cannot be comprehended, that is, it is. It's neither seen nor touched, for in visual or tactile sensation, the identity of the eye, the, it envelops the alterity of the object, which becomes precisely a content. And he believes that this is the root of all ethical failure, when the eye envelops or takes over the, dist the difference of the other. In other words, the aural face hails us in ethical demands because it resists this assimilation into the self. The idea of the face-to-face -face provides a useful theoretical grammar for thinking through how timbre carries ethical demand, I believe. In the modality of hearing, timbre is of prominent importance in the interface between our perception of the people and things in the world and those people and things themselves. Musical sounds don't just passively enter us through the channels of the flesh. They actively, they're actively processed, interpreted, and reenacted or mirrored through a complex system of intercorporeal uh, processing and mirroring. And every human produced sound is, in a crucial ethical sense, unique, particularly the voice. The voice has primacy here. As the philosopher Adriana Cavarero observes, uh, every human voice is obviously a sound, an acoustic vibration among, among others, which is measurable like all other sounds. But it's only as human that the voice comes to be perceived as unique. This means that uniqueness resounds in the human voice, or in the human voice, uniqueness makes itself sound. The ear, its natural destination, perceives this unique sound without any effort. This is timbre <laughs> we're talking about right now. The speed, the precision, the emotional connotations, affective bite of timbre. No matter what words are spoken. Again, this is transcending language. This is about the timbral content of the voice. No matter what you say, I know that the voice is yours. In short, the voice's yoursness is its ethical claim, its demand for a response. This is particularly true, moreover, in instances where the timbral qualities are considered noisy or unpleasant, in situations of listening when the gap between the listening self and the sonic other is at its widest and most, most ethically fragile. A similar logic can also apply in certain situations to musical instruments. Although Levinas did not conceptualize the face with timbre specifically in mind then, we must nevertheless ask ourselves, could timbre function as a kind of aural face? This question hinges uh, crucially on the phenomenology of listening. Uh, put as a question, assuming 
we accept the aural face of the other in musical terms. Do I have to make a sound mine in order for it to be meaningful? If so, to Levinas, quote, it is hence not a relation with the other as such, but the reduction of the other to the same. A situation of assimilation that he believes blots out the ethical demand of another person. For this reason, Levinas was leery of considering music and aesthetic experience more generally as a viable proxy for face-to-face -face ethical encounter. He writes, quote, the beautiful can be discussed as a face, but in it, there is also the possibility of enchantment. And from that moment, a lack of concern or ethical cruelty, unquote. Hearing another's speech affords a face-to-face, -face, but hearing another's music does not to him. Assuming pitch makes up the most important parameter of musical sound to many listeners, this is the epistemological basis for what the Tuvan ethnomusicologist refers to as pitch-centered listening, um, Valentina Suzuki, then perhaps this somewhat jaundiced view of music is warranted from a Levinasian view. Indeed, at least in theory, pitches exist in the public domain. You and I can both string together the same pattern of notes, uh, in a sequence to be sung aloud, to be played on an instrument, or notated, like I've notated here on the screen. Musical pitches combine a form of to combine to form a learned syntax available to everyone in a community, variable between cultural and historical contexts, but relatively stable within them. In a word, pitches are fungible. They're meant to function interchangeably across human bodies, instruments, memory, and time. The uh, turn-of-the-century American anthropologist John Fillmore exemplified the central premise of pitch-centered listening. He wrote, uh, this is right around the turn of the century, a tune is a tune, and the same tune, whether it is played on a violin, a piano, a flute, a clarinet, an oboe, or a trumpet, or sung by a bass, a soprano, or a cannibal savage, unquote. Read through the filter of Levinasian ethics, it's easy to see how enveloping the other's melodic sequence would run counter to a genuine face-to-face. -face. I'm not hearing you when you teach me a new t how a new tune goes. I'm hearing your pitch content abstracted and severed from the unique person producing it. Mirroring your tune, or singing, playing it back, hearing it out in my mind's ear via sub-vocalization, capturing it through the prism of notation. This is me incorporating or enveloping the tonal identity of your novel pitch sequence as my own. In this way, pitches might be said to represent in the musical realm, as Lovinas put it, the form in which the other becomes the same by becoming mine. But timbre works in a subtly different way, as we've discussed. While you might be able to sing the tune and the words to the song Mississippi Goddamn, for example, you cannot be Nina Simone singing this song. That is the Sorry, process. Zach. Uh, we, yes. we, we hear noises from the mic again. Oh, there's more. There's, are we, is this uh, okay? Yeah, this, it, is, it happens some, sometimes with those, um, with that setup. Uh, with um, the earphones. I apologize for that. It's, it's a little better now, though? Yeah, it seems related to movement. I'll, I'll try to be as still as I can. I'm almost done, too. <laughs> no, no, please go <laughs> on. It's really okay. interesting. <laughs> um, so, the tangible properties of another person's specific musical utterance, their personal sound, the grain of their voice, um, are not as readily assimilated as the notes that structure it. In contrast to pitch-centered listening, Valentino Suzuki describes timbre-centered listening as a perceptual attitude that prioritizes recognition of the uniqueness of each sonic event, much like observing the dynamic, always changing features of a natural landscape. In an ethically important sense, the unique corporeal identity of another's sound is always fleeting, distant, absolutely other in the Levinasian sense of the phrase, as impossible to pin down, possess, and control as the specific dance of shadows on a hillside. According to the empirical theories advanced in the first part of this talk, responding to the aural face through motor resonance and emotional contagion is a process of extension, whereby, as Richard Middleton, a musicologist, put it, we, quote, throw the weight of attention not on the self, its interests, concepts, and goals, but on the object, the other, in all of its materiality, unquote. The other does not become the same by becoming mine, as Levinas would say. Rather, in attuning ourselves to the timbres around us without possessing them, it might be said that the self 
becomes the other. Now, I don't want to draw out these analogies too far here. This uh, sort of divide and conquer idea of separating pitch and timbre may be useful for analysis and for close reading, but kind of hopeless to disentangle in reality. However, I've tried to make the case today that timbre is performing much of the perceptual work in disclosing the ethically motivating presence of others. Timbre is gleaned more quickly than syntactical features of music or speech, and its powerful workings are often unknown and unacknowledged during the listening process. We categorize timbre quickly and pre attentively. As demonstrated in the experiments reported previously, this indicates that timbre may precondition certain affective and empathic responses prior to any input from our more deliberative appraisal systems. As it turns out then, Levinas omits an important part of the ethical story. We may have already sorted the other in the aural face-to-face -face at the proverbial hello before we're even aware that this sorting has taken place. Sound precedes speech. Consequently, the aural face of timbre occupies a singularly potent and problematic position in the generation of musical meaning, and hence in the ethics of musical exchange and encounter. In fact, I think it's the gatekeeper to end. Um, I don't know of a more perfect way to close this talk uh, than the remarks from American anthropologist Alice Fletcher, describing her first encounter with indigenous American vocal timbre in 1893. Although from habit as a student, I had endeavored to divest myself of preconceived ideas and to rise above prejudice and distaste, I found it difficult to penetrate beneath the noise and hear what the people were talking about. I think I may safely say that I heard little or nothing of Indian music the first three or four times that I attended dances or festivals beyond a screaming downward movement that was gashed and torn by the pain of the beaten drum. The sound was distressing, and my interest in this music was not aroused until I perceived that this distress was peculiarly my own. Everyone else was so enjoying himself that I felt sure something was going to happen. It was not rational that human beings should scream for hours, looking and acting as did these Indians before me, and the sounds they made not mean something more than mere noise. Although the alien qualities of Indian singing were initially alarming to me, Fletcher's ethical awakening in which she realized that, quote, this distress was peculiarly my own. The frenzied and disturbing affective qualities she first attributed to the musicians themselves, evident in their screaming, were not intended for her. She affectively mirrored the distress embodied in those sounds, but had the reflexivity to recognize that her mirror wasn't clean. Her visceral alarm was not the same as what elicited it. Although she confessed that this absolutely other mode of musical expression was beyond her immediate comprehension, that is, she recognized nonetheless that the people were trying to service that had to be meaning, even if she couldn't see it first. Rather than turning away in fear from her own discipline, she responded to the effort to the demand of the other by granting this sonic expression meaning more, even though she couldn't exactly understand it. As Levy Hoss would say, Fletcher refused to Sorry to interrupt you again, but um, uh, the noise uh, came back. Is it still overwhelming? Okay. Yeah, it traits uh, 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 makes your uh, voice uh, barely intelligible. Oh my! Okay. Now it's this... okay. Okay, I, I'm going to try to just orient my body differently, and uh, I have another paragraph to go. So I'm we're almost we're almost there. I appreciate everybody's patience. I apologize for the, the technical difficulties with my, my headphones. Um, so Alice Fletcher is accepting this deep ambiguity and uncertainty that comes in encountering another's unique presence. Tambor is catalyzing here, in this example, an aural face-to-face, -face, a window into the drastic enigma of other minds. Now, to be clear, this moment of timbre-mediated ethical encounter was an ambivalent one, somewhat ironically, as the musicologist Daniel Walden has explained, Fletcher and her generation of comparative musicologists sought to reconcile the aporia of meaning in American Indian music by rushing headlong in into its pitch world. They felt they had to listen below the noise, they said, to extract the musical qualities of Indian expression, likening timbre to the extraneous mechanical noises of a phonograph player that must be ignored in order to appreciate a recording. In short, they needed to approach native song with the objective yardstick of pitch-centered listening. Walden notes, moreover, that there was an ethical motivation to listening below the noise, which, quote, 
seemed beneficial for the development of interracial empathy because it taught how to disregard features of a foreign musical culture that caused distress and focused on its essential beauty, unquote. On this count, explicitly casting timbre-centered listening as an obstacle to be overcome in order to separate the timbral husk from the kernel of pitch content, Fletcher expressed a value system characteristic very much of her time and place. But while listening below the noise may have been key to assimilating the pitch vocabulary of Indian music, a reduction of the other to the same familiar pitch classes and notational practices, then listening to the noise was crucially important to the blossoming of Fletcher's nascent sense of ethical responsibility. Her realization that it was not rational that human beings should scream for hours and not mean something other than mere noise. In conclusion, timbre-centered listening is not just a question of auditory orientation or aesthetic values. It's also an ethical wager. And I tried to explain how this might work in, over the course of this talk using both empirical evidence um, and more speculative theoretical evidence. We have the freedom to respond to another's musical timbre in any way we might imagine, as an invitation to empathy and care, as a relinquishment of the self, or as a bad sound that must be kept at arm's length and rejected, as something completely neutral, not worthy of our attention. In the vast majority of our listening biographies with music, these choices are barely considered. Although affectively potent, timbre is often invisible. We don't have to ask what it means. But at the perceptual edge between musical timbre and acoustically noisy timbre, the aporia of meaning becomes an especially symbolically and socially fraught space that is always tensely negotiated. How we respond to the aural face of other people reveals not just our own attitudes towards those others, it tells us a lot about ourselves. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks very much, Zach. Um, that was a very rich talk. And um, I think we'll, we're ready to open up the session to general discussion now. So everyone's microphones and videos are disactivated. Um, and so if you have a question, please just raise your virtual hand and I will activate them. Joshua might have a question, maybe. Sure, yeah, thank you. And um, <clears throat> sorry I snuck in during your introduction, um, but that was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> and it's I I particularly appreciate how you bring this ethical dimension um, to it as well, because I think it's something we perhaps don't think about as much as music researchers, but our kind of, you know, responsibilities, um, uh, I suppose. Um, uh, but I, I did have a question about um, about this this idea of the oral face and um, and the the relationship between the self and other and I mean I, I've been doing work on the synchrony bonding effect mostly mm. as um, yes. and you know which has you know has been suggested to sort of underpin some of these social bonding effects of music that um, that people like Patrick Savage have been have been talking about as you mentioned at the start um, and I guess one of the one of the theories is that you know when when people are synchronizing their action with each other then they're they're more likely to experience this sense of self other overlap so they may in fact mm. lose themselves mm -hmm. in the music and begin to you know merge with the other at least at, at some you know it's some concept um tombra seems to sort of throw a spanner in the works here if it is so um, so kind of you know uh, individual um so i'm wondering if you think there's you know would, would you expect some kind of tom effect of tombral similarity that it's like easier to merge with someone with someone else or or you know, do we in fact need pitch and rhythm to overcome our tonal differences? Um, I love the way you've just put that, Joshua. Needing pitch and rhythm to overcome timbral difference. I I, th I think this is a really rich question um, because, uh, as as you're pointing out, I'm I'm really glad you asked this question and you've incorporated. Um, I, I've really it's also great to meet you. I've been following your your work for years and. Um, of course, many models of synchronization and entrainment are um, lead with rhythm, and that makes complete sense um, for many reasons, right? Um, but the idea of co-performance, I, I guess there's an element in which uh, the voice also provides this kind of interpretive key for understanding others by way of uh, 
uh, matching certain gestural elements. I think the timbral components um, may not be as clear as, say, tapping to a beat or synchronizing, uh, synchronizing a, a periodic pulse between individuals. Um, but I think oftentimes we do. Sh I, I'm, I'm going to use the voice as, as, as an example right now. Um, you do modulate the quality of your timbral expression to match some something else. Like when you're singing along to Bob Dylan or something like that, you might be more inclined to take on or to to vocally, timbrally, mimetically engage with the way he sounds compared to, say, Louis Armstrong, who has a very different vocal sort of character. Um, in other words, any act of imitation, uh, any act of um, uh, sort of either sub vocal or actually overtly vocal mimetic engagement with another singer sometimes can involve this degree of timbral shaping to find some kind of a common ground. Because of course I can never sound like Bob Dylan, but I can come closer to sounding like Bob. We can find this kind of spot where my where myself merges with my timbral model of what he might sound like. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure if that's answering your question. I, I think that that it's your last comment was really uh, was really provocative to me that this this notion that pitch and other elements of music might overcome the intrinsic kind of uniqueness of timbre to allow us to engage socially. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would think we, we sort of need both, don't we, to sort of really exactly. see the other person as a person who is distinct from ourselves, because there is perhaps a danger in, in kind of totally yes. losing our individuality in, in, you know, if you take self-other overlap to an extreme. But yeah, perhaps there's a balance of, of these different musical elements that we find when coordinating with others um, to, tr to truly see them. Absolutely right. Perhaps. Thanks yeah, so thank much you. for that comment, Joshua. Our next question is from Christopher Peacock. Uh, um, you should be able to use your microphone and if you want to use your camera. Okay, can you see me? Can you hear me? Hi, Christopher. Great. Yes. Hi, hello. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, excellent. I'm, I'm a philosopher. Um, and since you talked a little bit about philosophy, I hope that gives me a green light for. Raising please, please, yes, teach, teach me something. I'm, I'm an armchair yeah, philosopher. So. Well, so it's a very, very general question about the relation between um, the social functional character of something and its nature in itself. And sometimes the social character or function of something is explained by a nature that's not in itself social. Okay. Now, I think in the case of the perception of timbre in music, you've made extremely good case that you cannot fully account for the phenomenology of the perception of timbre without involving this interpersonal dimension. Um, I, everything you said speaks to that. Um, but that wouldn't be true of the perception of pitch, uh, for example, which is obviously an, um, within, a, when, 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 within one or another tonal system is extremely important for the affect of music, for its emotional content and the rest. And so some of the, uh, the social um, function of music will be explained by a perception of pitch properties and the rest. And even those 40,000 year old instruments, you know, the, <laughs> the fifth and the octave and so forth. Um, um, so I wonder if you'd like to comment on, on that general issue. Um, so when you looked at all this recent uh, literature about social function of music, um, this question is always in the back of my mind. Um, how much does this really speak to the nature of the phenomenology, the perceptual system itself? Maybe there's something in the nature of perceptual music that's explanatory of the social function. Um, and we should characterize that as well. You can't fully characterize it simply by saying it's got these social characters. So that's the general area in which I'd, I'd just like to hear your thoughts. You, you've made an excellent point now that I, I, sh I should have been clearer in, in this talk regarding um, regarding the fact that, of course, timbre does not exist ever in isolation. This is engaging with a degree of abstraction um, at its core that um, that is anti-naturalistic. So 
the claims that I guess I am trying to explore with Tambor, I, I, I'm trying to be as precise as possible about bracketing off Tambor from other elements of music for the sake of, of theorizing some of these questions. Uh, but in reality, it is hopeless to disentangle timbre from pitch relations, from matters of loudness, uh, from matters of duration. These things co-vary and are uh, interdependent on one another. Um, so to, to claim that, that timbre is somehow, um, and this, this would be actually in, in reference to Joshua's comment as well, um, I guess I, I'm not trying to claim that timbre is somehow a privileged site or somehow uh, more socially uh, interesting than the other domains. Uh, rather, uh, I'm trying to sort of correct a particular, I guess, uh, lack of engagement um, from my colleagues <laughs> in musicology and music theory who have essentially ignored timbre until uh, 20 years ago. Um, by, uh, by introducing it into some conversations and into, in dialogue uh, with some of the other features. Uh, now, to to your broader questions, um, I would love to hear hear more of your observations about um, how you interpret um, some of the recent discussions about music as uh, sort of social music and social bonding hypothesis, for instance, of, of Savage. Because um, I, I I don't feel I'm really equipped to answer um, the the broader and I think richer and, and more important question that you're asking. And, and I'm curious um, with your background in philosophy, how you've managed and negotiated some of these, some of the elements of the question you just asked. Okay, well, I, I, I don't want to talk about my own views at all, but I think um, what I wanted to signal, I guess, was this mm -hmm. distinction between the cases in which you couldn't, fully account for the phenomenology, the subjective character of music itself, without adverting to this social dimension. And you're making an incredibly mm. good case for that, given the nature of the perception of timbre, what you said about indexicality, the perception of it essentially is um, not just a voice, but agency. I mean, this is this huge um, uh, role in our perception of music, that agency is underemphasized. Nonetheless, um, I think as far as the effect, effective character of music goes and why it's of value to us, I think it seems right to say in some cases um, that there's an, that music has a certain social function because of its phenomenology that in part is not intrinsically social in, in the perception mm. of pitch, the ability mm. to hear certain um, uh, tonal features metaphorically is something else, all, all of that doesn't really have intrinsically a social dimension, at least not obviously, it would need to be argued. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah so that's, that's, that's what I want to signal that issue. So there's, there's a certain sense in which the, the literature on social dimension of music um, is, well, to put it polite, is bracketing that question. Okay, it's, yes. not, it's not addressing it um, and it, it needs to be addressed. That, that's, all I, that's all I want to say. I don't want to hog the time here. Thank you very much for for bringing these these points to my awareness. Victoria. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, it was really a fascinating talk and you give us a lot to think about it. Uh, I am I wondering whether are you aware of any evidence in in since uh, you made it very clear that timber is a, a crucial element uh, um, for personal identity. So I wonder whether, is there any evidence either in neuropsychology or in psychopathology of, a, of specific deficits in the recognition of timber, in, in particularly in relation to uh, human personal identity? Thank you. Th this is a really fascinating question that, um, a number of groups have been exploring. Um, Pascal Berlin, uh, his group has has looked quite intensively at vocal timbre perception, uh, for instance. And uh, I I am not aware of the neuropathology literature on this. I'm sure there are others who who could really inform this question. I'm, I'm thinking now about who I might contact to really to, to for some guidance in that area. Um, 
But uh, Billings Group has, over the last couple of decades, done a number of studies, for instance, looking at uh, voice timbre perception and the role of the fusiform gyrus, for instance, and fusiform face areas um, in a deciphering and categorization of, of different vocal timbre. Um, that would seem to suggest, at least, um, that a, a deficit in timbre processing uh, could have social ramifications in terms of, of how uh, the voice might be able to disclose the identity of others. Um, it, would, it would suggest that. I, I'm not, but I, because I'm not aware of that literature, um, I would need to do a bit more research on, on, on the specifics of how that might work. Um, yeah. Oh, I, I believe you're muted, Vittorio. Yeah, sorry. A, a related question probably would be, how much do we know about uh, the specific sensitivity uh, uh, of timber for the human voice uh, yeah. in relation to a, a, a broader a notion of timber that, as you clearly yes. uh, uh, told us, uh, can apply to any uh, auditory source, so to speak. So, is there something specific in the in in the timber of the human voice that uh, possibly is also specifically processed by our brain, or it, it's part of a more general uh, skill in in perceiving uh, timber differences, no matter what the the sound source might be. Yes, the voice um, has an absolutely privileged place um, in, in terms of our, our perceptual hierarchy in, in, in timbre. Um, and uh, one of the sets of contrast that I, I didn't have time to get to when I was going over the, the neuroimaging study was actually comparing perception of these instrumental sounds with perception of the vocal sounds. And the voice has a, a signature that's unlike anything else. Um, it, uh, even though the voice is singing the same pitch as the instruments, it's matched for loudness, matched for duration. Uh, they're all treated as instruments, more or less, singing the same pitch. Uh, the voice just has this different, very different sort of uh, processing, uh, sets of processing patterns behind it in our study. And this replicates many, many other, any other studies. Um, it also appears that, um, for instance, some of the work by David Popple's group at NYU over the last couple of years have looked at the perception, for instance, of screaming qualities or uh, vocal expression that's nonverbal, but that signals a heightened sense of arousal and imperilment with the voice. Um, the scream seems to have a, uh, their group sort of located uh, a, a, a neuro, a biomarker essentially for the processing of human screams that is distinct from synthesized sounds that acoustically resemble a scream, from a pig screaming, from it is specific to which the sound sense. of a human. Which Absolutely. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Absolutely right. Thank you. I appreciate you asking that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Um, I just saw that uh, Say also has a question, so um, I'll um, make sure to activate you after. Um, so yeah, thanks Zach again. And so uh, you talked about how we are, we effectively mirror sound through embodiment, uh, but then comes the aesthetic and ethical judgments and which um, do not always reflect a clean mirror. And I was wondering if you have any ideas on how timbre can be used as a social vehicle for cleaning our mm. collective mirror. Um, that's my first question. Oh, I absolutely love this question. I feel like I would probably need a bit more time to deliberate, to give even a halfway intelligent and responsible reply to you because um, I, I, I do believe there are, there are, <laughs> there are sort of theoretically and both, we could even sort of speak more clinically or therapeutically about how timbre might be incorporated into different paradigms, um, that have, that, 
might be intended, say, for instance, uh, with folks who have some deficit in social cognitive function. Um, but um, I feel like I would be, I would probably be stepping in it if I just kind of started to riff on that right now. <laughs> this is a conversation I would love to have with you going forward. And if you have any ideas on this, let's let's please discuss this because um, you, you're asking exactly the right question right now. Great. Um, as a follow up, um, I wanted to ask also if if there's any um, data or just yeah any research on cultural differences of uh, timbral tolerance. Mm -hmm. mm. Ver embarrassingly little, uh, shamefully little, to be to be completely honest from from my point of view. Um, there are there are a few studies um, that that I'm aware of, at least from the last five or six years, for instance, that have looked at perception of consonants and dissonance, um, both intervallically, uh, dissonant intervals, but then also kind of conceived timbrally in terms of spectral disposition, auditory roughness, and these kinds of types of things. And um, one one of the claims that has been bandied about amongst music scientists for quite some time, Leonard Bernstein was a big advocate of this view, for instance, in the 1950s and 60s, that there is a universal human uh, tendency to towards consonant intervals, timbres, um, and that th this is sort of universally pleasant because it is more mathematically pure and closer to nature. Um, some recent evidence suggests that this might not be as transparently true as 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 some have, have believed um, when isolating groups of people who who have not had uh, much previous exposure to the norms of, of music making, certainly in sort of a Western context um, in in various behavioral indices for uh, attraction and aversion towards different sound complexes. It appears that there might actually be more of a be be a greater degree of cultural variability there than we previously thought. Um, but this is this is really an under researched set of questions. Um, and really, I, more researchers need to start taking seriously the the cross cultural comparisons. Right. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. So, um, say Ituriaga. Um, um, you should be able to use your microphone and video camera. Thank you so much. I don't know if you can see me. I maybe I have a problem with my camera, so I'm going just to speak maybe. Um, uh, I would like to take the idea about uh, timber as a social entanglement way to connect uh, with the other identity. And uh, to understand this, uh, how can we think in timber as a way to integrate non-human voices in our socialization, socialization uh, using music as a vehicle of uh, this um, uh, um, uh, expanded sociality? Mm -hmm. uh, mm, connected more or less with the idea of acoustemology from Stephen Feld and obviously thinking in uh, the posthumanism uh, point of view, uh, particularly the idea of rolling from uh, uh, Donna Araway, that give us uh, the, 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 um, uh, to put the eye in how can we hear other species not just uh, uh, human voices, but not human voices, and not thinking just in animals, but in elements in general, and how materiality is inside of timber. Uh, and I am thinking particularly in uh, such um, uh, how cultures integrate uh, in instruments elements, and how these elements uh, speak in a tone of voice, in a timbre, in a particular timbre that says something about the environment, about the relation between these very different kind of voices. So I don't know what is your opinion about the timbre in non-human voices. Yes, it's really, it's quite fascinating uh, to me that uh, this, 
the, the Tuvan ethnomusicologist, who I referenced briefly in my talk, uh, Valentina Suzuki, um, she really developed this notion of timbre-centered listening in relation to natural sounds and animal sounds in the Tuvan soundscape. Um, so you, your, your mention of Stephen Feld and kind of and uh, soundscape studies um, and acoustomology, um, I think is is very closely aligned, I think, with what Suzuki is accomplishing when she describes timbre centered listening along naturalistic lines. Um, her her notion, this theory comes to her in conversation with herders who are talking about uh, various Tuvan vocal techniques uh, that are meant to either speak to the animals, for instance, uh, techniques that are basically a conversation with, uh, with yaks, um, or be a sort of reflection upon a changing landscape. So she talks about clouds, patterns of, sh of shadow on the horizon, and aligning one's voice or aligning one's sound on an instrument called the Uyghur uh, with the pattern, with the play of shadows or with the natural landscape. Um, so I, I, I'm really happy that you brought this, and I think this is a very important point, uh, that in a sense, because of timbrels, uh, because of, of timbre's claim, immediacy and claim on materiality, uh, this, I think, opens us onto questions of interspecies community, of, of the post-human, um, of a kind of ecological notion of, uh, of, of social perception, of sound perception, um, that might also differ, again, in Suzuki's mind, from a timbre-centered or from a pitch-centered way of looking at music, which views sounds as these kinds of abstract entities that play an instrumental role in musical human communication. Um, timbre might seem to be subtly different in that regard. Um, I can tell you from, from my own personal experience, I play this instrument as Anna mentioned in my, in my really generous introduction uh, called the shakohachi uh, flute, which is a bamboo flute from Japan. I've been playing that instrument for 15 years and I lived in Japan for a number of years studying the instrument. Um, the entire timbral logic of that instrument comes out of an awareness of environmental sound. There are techniques that are meant to tap into uh, the sound of, of insect noises. Uh, bird call techniques are prevalent on the instrument. The sound of wind going through a bamboo grove. These are all codified into the, uh, into the aesthetic system of shakuhachi playing. And as you engage as a shakuhachi player, teachers will tell you the first step to becoming a good shakuhachi player is going outside and listening. That's what gives you the timbral insight and intuition to make the right sounds on the instrument. Um, so, so I think what you're saying is 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 quite important, um, and um, I I'm, would really um, love the opportunity to do some, to to think more on these sorts of topics and perhaps have a conversation with you outside of this context about these issues. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So beautiful at your uh, explanation of your very own experience, uh, because uh, your connection with the individuality of uh, the materiality of your instrument is something that really explain how uh, multi-species relations across music can uh, evolve and flourish. Thank you so much. Thank you. If there aren't any other questions, I think we can close the session. Uh, thank you very much again, Zach. Um, it was a very fruitful talk and fruitful discussion, and um, you've given us a lot to think about. Uh, so see you, everyone, in two weeks, same time, same virtual space um, for our next talk. and. Have a good day, uh, Zach, and good evening to everyone on this side of the pond. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very again. much, everybody. Thank you again very much. Bye-bye. I appreciate your time. Great questions, too. Thank you. Bye.
Bye.